I know that I've heard this term before, and I know that I should know what this term means, and I'm almost embarrassed. No, I'm not embarrassed to ask, because I believe that this is the perfect forum to ask questions like this. Because if I, if I am like, wait a minute, what does that word mean? I guarantee you that there's someone who absolutely doesn't know what it means. Oh, yeah. You made it, you just said, it's like, I'm going to stripe it. Ah. And I know that that is a s industry standard term that is based off of something that was actually practical of, of actually striping, but I can't remember what it applies to. What does striping mean? So striping is very simply when you record it. it I, I suppose it could apply to anything, but I've only ever really heard it in the context of orchestral music, meaning like you probably could use this term when referring to recording a band, but I've never heard it in that context. Um, but it would refer to recording the orchestra in component parts. Usually it's by family. So like you would do your strings and then you would do your brass and then your winds mm -hmm. and then your percussion if there's choir or whatever. Um, but it can also mean more subdivided than that. Like, for example, in the Hans Zimmer world, the remote control productions way of doing things, they often will have like the short choppy strings doing these, you know, tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick, very tight rhythmic figures separate. Like They'll do a rhythmic. separate session from like the long flowing melodic or like a pad or something. So even if even if you have, you know, violins holding a note and below them violas going tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick -a, they'll actually stripe those separately because they'll produce them. They'll want to have independent control in the mix. Is it because and, they want to be able to, like you said, you, you wanted to isolate those. So it's like, I want to be able to dynamically raise those deca deca 16th note things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a fancy way of saying comp. Like you're gonna, you're gonna comp those together, right? I, I, I would always, think, in a band, it's like, don't worry, we'll do overdubs and comp it. So that's the way that a band would, would, would think about that. You do your, sometimes you'll do your drums and your bass together. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, you're going to do, or you can either do your whole rhythm section together, but most bands don't play together. It's like, then we're going to do our, our keys and our horns and our, you know, lead guitar stuff overdubbed. It is essentially the same thing as overdubbing. I've always understood the term comping to be almost more of a horizontal thing where we'll take a little bit of this take and we'll take a little bit of that take, you know, at bar 20, they meet and the comp is the two different takes, you know, sure. where the first half is that take, the second half is that take. Yeah, whereas yeah. Like striping we, is we, vertical. That makes sense. Is but there, I could yeah, be you're wrong. Looking I could at be your, wrong. No, 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 no. I just remember there being like a striping. There was, there was, I thought there was actually something to do with like, there was something about a pencil that they would ah, actually stripe that's streamers. the tape. Streamers. That's where I got it from. Streamers and punches was the old fashioned way. They still use them, but, but it used to be a literal physical a grease pencil drawn on the the film the, the, strip, right? The film strip that was being projected behind the orchestra while you're recording, and the way so it they worked knew... was. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. It's all it's all good. So, the way it worked was uh, a three foot yardstick would um, correspond at the frame rate they were running, which was I if I surely twenty four frames a second, like based around the fact that each frame was what one and whatever inch from top to bottom they realized that a three foot yardstick corresponds to precisely two seconds of footage so if you put up a yardstick where it's going ever so slightly diagonally where you can draw uh, uh, across all these individual frames uh, where you know a grease pencil line that starts on the you know the left and ends on the right over the course of the three feet of the yardstick what that means is when you then project the footage a line that is essentially vertical, it's technically slightly diagonal, but a vertical line will go exactly two seconds uh, from when it appears to when it ends. And so if you're conducting and you're like, okay, you know, I want the orchestra to have, you know, I want the, the big timpani hit in bar 15 to correspond to that shot of the door opening, like right on the cut. You go and you find that frame, you make that your end point, you draw your line so that you know, and then t uh, the, what they would also do, that's the streamer, the punch, is then you take a literal hole punch and you go chunk right in the middle of the frame of the one you're wanting to hit. And so then you're conducting the orchestra and you realize, okay, I'm in bar 14 and the timpani in 15 is supposed to, you know, correspond to the door. And two seconds before that, here comes your line and you give your downbeat and then there's a flash of white light from the hole punched frame 
where there's just light shooting straight through it. And then you're like, bam, I nailed it. Um, and really, <laughs> obviously, the whole art of conducting to streamers and punches is kind of a lost art because basically once you started relying heavily on click tracks for everything, you didn't really need any of that. Now, older conductors will still use them as kind of like a, I'm convinced it's just for nostalgia, but there, but, but it can also serve as like a visual reinforcement. If you're focused on a million things and the click is one among many vying for your attention, you'll have the streamers and punches there to kind of keep you, you know, on, on, tr on track. And is that a, who is making that? Because obviously, there does the conductor get like the the film reel? It's like here's your here's the here's the cut just for you. We made a print just for you to. Mm -hmm. They do did the yeah. orchestra by. They had a work print that was like a low grade, un other uncolor corrected, blah blah blah. That the composer would have their own moviola, which is sort of the little projector that would show them the movie on a little screen, and. The music editor, like my old pal Kenny Hall, who sadly is no longer around, but he was Jerry Goldsmith's music editor. Um, his job was to operate the moviola, and to and and they would sit there and they would back it up. Okay, you know, take me back twenty frames. What's that shot? You know, go and look and say, okay, yeah, you know what? Let's let's make sure to put a punch on that. And so then they would go and work out the timings, and Kenny would prepare. I have xeroxes of a bunch of his timing sheets where it would say, you know, okay, Star Trek, the motion picture, reel three at seven minutes, 24 seconds in, we want first frame of the queue to happen here. And then he would make all the timings. And so then when they would work out uh, the tempo of the music, he would know, okay, well, given that we're moving at this tempo and we're starting on this frame, that means this thing that Jerry wants to hit, uh, like the cut to the enterprise or whatever is going to happen on, you know, bar 17. He like he would just do the math on okay at this tempo you know knowing these frames, the, it it would work out at this point. So then when Jerry's sketching, they would literally have the sheet music where they would they would put a big line down the page and say, here's where that punch is gonna happen. So he's writing knowing okay here we go I'm I, I'm at bar fourteen I'm a few bars away from it still and then that's the they would often conduct from those sketch pads because that's where all the notes were written you know and they would leave other little notes in the margins saying like above bar 16 the you know we see uh, captain kirk uh, look off to the left and yell or something like they would leave little notes so that they know at all times okay i'm where i i'm where i'm supposed to be i'm on track and um it's a very analog way of but get this it gets even more interesting in the old days of animation the animators obviously that's a very labor intensive process so you think of the old fashioned Looney Tunes, you know, Carl Stalling, the kind of inventor of, of that sound, I don't, right? What came first? This that, is this is what I want to know. It's, it's like, the most uh, amazing thing. Here's the answer. N neither. Hold on. What? It's insane. It When you think about the craft required to do this, like, like I was talking to a friend and we were talking about people who served in World War II and he goes, you know, talk about, you know, like I have a, family member who went and he, he volunteered to go join the, the, the U.S. military. He was eager to go fight Nazis and he gets wounded in the Battle of the Bulge. And and I was telling this to a friend just last night and he goes, yeah, we're not men. Uh, he, he, he's like, he's like, we're not adults. We're not heroic. We're not brave. We're not we're, none of those things. He's like, there's somebody who literally he, they, they put their they put their money where their mouth were, as it were. And, and by way of analogy, it's like. We have it so as composers today. I have it so easy compared to the people seventy years ago. Figure like when you think about the complexity of what they were doing, and the fact that well, there the, was no safety net in the, in the form of computers <clears throat> and Apple Z and all all the shit yeah. we take for granted. Undo now. Yeah. four levels. I, we were literally Pam and I were literally watching. Um, not, I don't know why I said literally. We were watching as opposed to um, metaphorically watching. Metaphor. We were. We were. <laughs> Yeah, we were philosophically watching. Um, we were watching um, Singing in the Rain. Ah, nice. And just, I I understand now that Gene Kelly was not exactly the the, the kindest human. I didn't know that. Is he um, is he a skeletons in the closet kind of guy? Uh, he was just more. He was a hard ass. And mm. um, Debbie Reynolds specifically told stories about how like there's one scene where she had the flu. And she was she was incredibly ill, and he was like relentless, and they just kept going and kept going and kept going. Um, 
whatever, not making mistakes or not making any excuses for his behavior. I I remember the first time that I sat and watched Singing Rain was at my grandparents' house, and they were like that. That was their um, uh, my grandfather. He was the one who taught me how to throw a football, and he didn't do a great job. But he was great. I was a bad pupil because I never learned how to throw a football. <laughs> but I remember throwing my football with my grandfather, um, <clears throat> and the my grandmother was like, "You need to know what these movies are about. These great." the the quote golden age of, of cinema where it was you know oh, it was yeah. Metro Goldwyn Mayer you know it, it was singing in the rain all of the Rodgers and Hammerstein um, uh, one of your favorites West Side Story like these are the movies that I would go over on a Friday night and and, and spend the night with my grandparents and watch oh, these kind of great. movies it was fantastic so I I had that great education but I was fascinated and I remember even the first time I watched it it wasn't so much like the great you know dancing it all be romance and all that stuff that wasn't the one that got me the one that got me was um make them laugh hmm. I I I couldn't understand was Donald O'Connor hearing the song and dancing to it or was he just doing all that because I understand how music videos worked. You know, we're miming along. But I was like, how are they doing this? And I never understood do which came first, the chicken or the egg. Do you score it first and then they play it back? Or are you dancing and then they're scoring to it? Because it's it was so reflective and responsive. And I know that you love to compose this way too, especially in games, um, to the world is responding to you as as a player, and the world is responding to you, to you narratively via the music. So do, how did that happen? Do you know? I don't know in the specific case of that one. Um, I would think the older you get, uh, like the, the further back you go with these musicals, I mean, the the um, the they would have had to, uh, pre, I would think, be recording and playing back on set and then figuring and then essentially, you know, not using none of the production sound from the set and relying entirely on pre-record. I would think because I just don't see technologically how they could possibly have done it the other way around. But this is an area that I, I realize I don't fully know the answer. The choreography that either way, it's, it's an incredible feat because either the choreography has to be like, for some reason, they the, the composer decided to put in a a, a rake on the xylophone. <laughs> I need to create a physicality to represent that. Or, I do believe it is that. In in other words, I, to me, I I'm, we have to we have to solve this because it it is it is something that has been. I believe that those tenements still apply. They're not anachronistic. They, mm-hmm. they they need to be streamers and punches still apply to the way that we do everything. This moment needs to line up here. That that goes to performance. That goes to music. That goes to design. That goes to everything. Because if the point is to have whatever that timpani hit to that shot, whatever that means, as an actor, I need to understand. When I've a, I've, a lot of times, the director has said, "I need you to not be angry." Is like. Do you know what just happened? Like, I'm reading the same script that you're reading, and this is the moment he'd be angry. Is like, yeah, but I need you to not be as angry in this moment because we got to go here. We were watching a show the other night. I don't know if you're watching This Is Us or not. By the way, this is the episode. I I, I feel like this is Streamers and Punches is, first of all, an incredible title. Uh, you and I are both short on time. But the I find this incredibly fascinating, and if I find it fascinating, I think people have found it fascinating too. You're an incredible, veritable fountain of knowledge. We're watching this episode, and I found myself kind of cross arms sitting back, watching this performance, going, kind of whiffed it. Here's this big moment between two huh. brothers, and it's this big apologetic moment, and it just kind of like fell flat, and they kind of hugged it out, and it was a bro moment, and went, wow, oh, man. It was okay. It wasn't great. It didn't move me. And that's because 10 minutes later, the real moment happens on the couch. Right. And I went, damn. I judged the performances. I judged the directing. I judged everything. And to me, the restraint 
and the, the deafness of skill for a director to go, perfect. I got you to feel exactly the way that I was hoping you would feel. Because now, yeah, we've the s- we've set the table. Yeah, for sure. It, it that's that that that's the streamer sense. and the punch, right? I can't build up to this. I need to have it happen here. And that white flash of light, when you realize that the reason why it felt insincere is because it was narratively, and to be able to reflect that in the performance, that is something that I feel. I think the art has been lost of understanding. It's like someone needs to draw the big grease pen along the print of whatever the the script is or whatever the score is because it's like hmm. we're building up to a moment and if we don't know where that is, if we don't have that yardstick to measure, we're going to miss our punch. You know, as a as an aside, the when you mentioned Make Them Laugh, I just recently saw some trivia that apparently when they were blocking out that song, they just said, can the props department send over everything that they can manage? And they said, you know, because they said, we want to just find some some business, basically, to see about how to make them laugh. And they were like, you got to narrow it down. And he just said, like, we don't know what we want. And then they so they randomly brought a mannequin. No and, and, way. and it was like and it was just like. I can work with this. And it was all essentially improvised and, and spontaneous. I think it was while they were blocking. I don't think they were shooting because then they saw that and they realized, oh, what a gold mine. But it was basically just someone in the prop department going, I, I don't really know what to suggest. I so got here's, this, here's some I shit. I got this doll. Yeah. Basically, what are you going to yeah. do with it? Donald Carr, I'm going to make out with it. <laughs> yeah. How and about it, that? It was totally kind of spur of the moment. Um, I want to answer your question, though, about how they did animation because it is it, it, to that Please. to that idea of there's a technical aspect to this craft that we've gained a lot by not having to worry about, but I do occasionally pine for thinking about, man, those innovators, especially the, you know, 75, 80 years ago, where they just had so little to work with compared to now, and they still managed to write these enduring, these enduring pieces and these enduring scores. Um, Animation was a particular challenge because the composer, there was no way for the composer to actually work with visual information. The, the, because the, it takes so long to animate. And so it would be, okay, well, let's describe for you. And then you can think about how crazy, you know, Mickey Mousey, that term obviously comes from that, you know, born of that era where you've got, you know, on the Disney side, you've got things that are very alive and animated, but obviously very kind of heartfelt and emotional. And then you've got the very wacky sensibility of Warner Brothers. And that's where Carl Stalling is. And it's very jazzy and it's it, it's very kind of big bandy. And... um the all the Looney Tunes and, and all that kind of stuff. And the way they did it was that the animation department would create these timing documents that the animators are working to and the composers are working to. And it was just, you know, at 12 seconds and nine frames, uh, Bugs Bunny bursts out of the ground. And so the animators are knowing, OK, we have to make sure that our timeline as we are animating yields that at 12 seconds and nine that. frames. That's where he appears because the composer is also over there and the sound people are doing the same. And then it's like, OK, at the end, let's all just put it together and hope that everybody did what they were supposed to do. And that because how else could you do it? It took so long that if you had to do everything in a kind of concatenated way, you, yeah. it would take you 10 years to make a single a single episode of something. So the composers literally couldn't see it until the music was done and recorded and the thing was finished. Something that fascinates me, and I, to to this day, I, I hold true, and I'm really, <laughs> Traveler watches very little TV. And when I say TV, I mean screen. Um, what he actually yeah. prefers to do is to listen. So he, if he wants to play with his trash trucks, he's like, I want to I listen to trash trucks. And so we'll find a YouTube video of fascinated with trash trucks, and he'll have the sound going while he is playing with this. Um, or there's this, the new Mickey Mouse, um, uh, cartoons are shout out to Chris Willis, dude. They're hilarious. They are, they are, I, I found myself cracking up. They're, they feel like Ren and Stimpy to me. So it's great, oh, really? but so good. Um, but the, they still hold up now as much as they did then they're timeless perennial um somehow they they, they've they've managed to just constantly still find themselves an influence of uh um or influential as an art form entertaining as as you know fodder for your eyes whatever but Mm -hmm. the thing that that i i still get caught by is 
they were the preamble. It was it was the newsreel, a cartoon, and the movie. <laughs> yeah. Th- this wasn't until the seventies. Really, there wasn't a Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour. There wasn't the Looney Tunes show until like the seventies and eighties. It was from the thirties, forties, fifties, and sixties. I think maybe in the mid mid to late sixties when it started popping up on TV because like Howdy Doody became a thing. They're like, oh, kids are watching TV, right? Because parents are well. Remember, in the early days, TV didn't broadcast twenty four hours a day. It was like no. at, at midnight or eleven o'clock or whatever. It just the it signal went dead. It just it stopped. After, after I remember this. After the news, you would get the national anthem and a test pattern. Yeah, and that's it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the or notion static. of the notion of like late night. You know, just stock like old reruns or whatever that they, at some point they realize, oh, we can broadcast 24 seven and, and just we can just put old content or something like that on it. I, I think Johnny Carson was and the only reason why they did it was because of advertisers. Right. We Got have it. to give people a reason. People are staying up too late. Well, advertisers want to what, what are people staying up because of? Well, they're, they're worried about their money. They're worried about their health. Well, if we <laughs> filled up that airtime. They're also just high and 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 uh, looking for, maybe. you know, looking, looking uh, like. What's, but if, what's, you, if you what's what's nearby the majority, food? the majority of, of adver, ad, advertisements or advertisements, depending upon where you are in the world, that are that are happening on 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 TV. It's I didn't know what mesothelioma was. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Until watching late night TV, um, it is it is always like invest that's in the uh, put your savings in gold. Uh, that yeah. kind of shit. Yep. I'm Chuck Connors, and I'm dead, but I'm here to talk to you about <laughs> gold coins. Yep. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was it was wrapping this up in advertising, and still talking. The, 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 there's a talk that Rod Serling gives about um, TV, and he goes, "You don't, you know." You don't even remember this, and this is like 67, 70 when he actually probably about seventy, seventy one when he's talking about this. I was this, very young then, so I don't really remember. You were very young. You're just yeah. a, a wee lad of nine. Um, <laughs> but he said, you know, it was, hey, there's this TV that people are watching, and the advertisers, Colgate, Texaco, uh, American Spirit, or not even American Spirit, but like uh, Philip Morris. These are the people that have the money to actually be able to pay to produce content for this television but you can't just have an hour-long thing of people going so here's gasoline and you put it in your car what do we do well let's make a show that we are able to go and thanks again to our sponsor philip morris for bringing it here and philip morris reminds you when you smoke you look better if you smoke with a philip morris cigarette <laughs> and now here's dinah Shore to sing for you another song you know it was it was that kind of bullshit just like how do we prop up the fact that we're pushing our products and then they become narrativized and you became these new serials there was dragnet there were all these and then there was westerns because westerns were cheap and easy to shoot you could go to Paramount Ranch over here right. and shoot as if you were in the Old West. So that's where all of this stuff came from. But it was all people just shilling. And so the people that actually got to pay for it and decide Chuck Connors is going to be the rifleman was Philip Morris because they yeah. were paying for it. Gulf Western was the was the whole – they ran the show that bled into movies. It's anyway, that's you know a, that's so, a tangent upon a tangent. But anyway, no, it's it, it's it's all it's all an interesting part of the kind of history of the of the medium. And, and it's, it's always especially funny when people say, you know, back when it used to be about the art, now everything's so commercial. I'm like, it's probably it, far more it, about the art today than it yes. ever was. There was there was never a director that people cared about. It wasn't until oh, the, it's not just that. In the old days, the director was you know how like on TV directors are a little bit swap them in, swap them out, and the showrunner and the executive producers tend to be the creative figureheads of a, of a show, yes. just because they need someone to manage a shoot. Basically, a direct. I mean, I'm I'm underselling what a director in episodic TV does, but for like a network show, you know, on a on a CSI or something like that, if you look up the director credits on IMDb, you'll see there's like 50 directors who have all you know done an episode here, two episodes there, and they they come and that's in. why a lot of times, especially on shows that are on like uh, sci-fi, CW, um, or whatever, you'll find that actors on the show yeah. are directing episodes because they write into their deals. Like, fine, if you want to direct an episode, go for it. It gives them directing credit, but it's like you're 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 playing. And I'm again not disparaging anybody that's 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 directing one of these episodes because there's still a, a very 
um, it, it's a it's a challenging task. Speaking from someone who they is have directed, real responsibilities. Is, yes, they have real responsibilities, but it's the best way to do it because. You're not having to your, your your camera lenses, your camera package, your aesthetic, your palette. Everything is already your even the way that is going to be edited is already established. You're playing bowling with the bumper rails up. Yep. You can't fail. So might as well get cut your teeth there and experience it there. But I'm sorry that that, that was I was going off of your tangent. So well, that, well, it just that that model of the TV director is basically how film directors were in the early days of the Hollywood studio system because MGM made the movie. And right. they had staff directors whose job was to coordinate with the staff cinematographer. And they had, as I think we've talked about here before, staff orchestras. The score, the composers worked for the studio, and, and the musicians showed the up to work. The actors worked for the studio. You're yep. on a contract for MGM for the next five pictures. You yeah, can't go anywhere And they would, and they would trade like baseball teams. Like like literally, you know, if you give us Errol, uh, Errol Flynn for, a, a, you know, one picture, we'll give you... You know, Douglas Fairbank or whatever, like like they would actually negotiate these these trades. And it was all very much uh, about the the company is who's making it. So that's why when you because you mentioned something about directors kind of stepping into the limelight that that definitely came only starting really in the I mean, there are 70s. exceptions, but I, I was going to say 50s, 60s because there are. You know, there are kind of auteurish directors in the 60s, like Franklin Schaffner directing Planet of the Apes and whatnot. But because the studio sure. system was pretty much dead by then. Uh, but, yeah, um, but it, it wasn't until like you can have whatever you want until you started having like Steven Spielberg. Yeah, and like Scorsese and, and uh, Scorsese, Spiel, all, all the San Francisco guys, right? Yeah. The Coppola, uh, um, uh, Lucas. I always forget, uh, uh, Brian, De uh, Brian Denny, De Palma, Brian De Palma, Coppola, Spielberg, all those guys were like, wait a minute, our movie made how, how many dollars for the studio? And if you've never read or watched um, The Kid Stays in the Picture, it is a brilliant, self-indulgent shining of the light on the Hollywood, dying Hollywood system, and how that, how that um, it's an incredibly inspiring story too. Bob Edmonds just, just passed last year, two years ago maybe. Uh, um, yeah, I was gonna say, I think it's, COVID. yeah. Wait, what? Because of two COVID. Years ago. Oh. Well, I, COVID like 2021 just kind of blend. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. 2019 is the most pre is like the is last year still. <laughs>